My sermon today is going to be found uh, from Acts chapter 6, uh, so if you want to turn there, that would be great. I'm going to start with some Shakespeare, just to prove that I'm a cultured individual, you know. In perhaps Shakespeare's most famous play, Romeo and Juliet, uh, we have perhaps the most famous scene, which is, uh, you know, Juliet in her, uh, on her balcony and uh, giving this soliloquy, which is a word to describe, you know, thinking out loud uh, so that people in a play can kind of hear, uh, or people who are witnessing the play can kind of hear what this character is supposedly thinking. And she's standing on her balcony, thinking about this man, Romeo, whom she has met, whom she, well, she loves, apparently. You know, classic, met you yesterday in love deeply. And uh, in, in this famous scene, in order for us to understand it, we have to understand that, that, you know, Romeo and Juliet's families are kind of like at war, as it were. They don't like each other. They're fighting with each other. They come from opposite sides of this um, th this conflict do Romeo and Juliet. And then we have that famous Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Where are you? That's what he's, she's saying. <laughs> Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not be but sworn, my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Romeo, who's, you know, hanging out behind a bush, says to himself, Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Shall I interrupt her out loud thoughts? Juliet continues, "'Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though, not a Montague. What's a Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man." Where are our names in our bodies, is the question she's asking. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo doth thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. That's all we're going to do. You didn't come for a you know, one-man version of Romeo and Juliet. That would get weird, but... This scene in Romeo and Juliet is so famous uh, because of a couple things. I mean, on the one hand, it is the beginning of this, the rest of the story. But yet we still use that quote, what is a name? What's in a name that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet? The point being, if we called a rose a daffodil, but we meant the rose, it would still smell like a rose. If we called a rose a weed, it would still smell like a rose. What's in a name? She asks. And the implied answer is nothing. There's nothing important about a name because you are still you regardless of what your name would be. I, I maybe should have read this, uh, this soliloquy uh, four times every time we named our children because you can ask Lauren, but I like... I, I anguished over how to name our children. It's like, this is what they're going to be called for the rest of their life. This is so much responsibility that I have over this person. Hilariously, you find out that like you can change a baby's name for free up to a year. But could you imagine like sending out birth certificates? Like, hey, birth announcement, so-and-so was born. And then you show up to the family reunion. You're like, yeah, we didn't like that name. We changed it. But you could. 
And, and Shakespeare's point is, what is in a name? Nothing. I think we all think that maybe he's wrong a little bit. I said our passage comes from Acts chapter 6. This is what we're going to read today. During those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our our part will devote ourselves to prayer and the serving of the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmeni, Parmenas, Parmen, yes. Uh, this is, per, is permission if you struggle with Bible names, so does your pastor, it's okay. And Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem and a great many to the faith. Here in Acts chapter 6, we find a similar scenario that we find in Romeo and Juliet. There are two groups that are in conflict now, luckily for us, it, it appears to be less barbaric, less violent, right? Our scene does not begin with sword fighting and death. But there's, there's angst, there's anguish, there's quarreling and fighting among this community from the very beginning of our story. And here's what's so interesting to me. The story begins with good news. The, the number of believers was rapidly growing. People are rapidly becoming Christians. They are rapidly becoming followers of Jesus. And in the midst of that, the church has a problem. <laughs> Which is my reminder to you that if, if, you're, if you're at a church, this one right now, and you're like, man, there's, there's, this new, there's always a new problem showing up. That's not always a sign of, 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 of sickness or illness. It's not always a sign that something's wrong. It just means that the more people you get involved, the more people are involved. <laughs> the more problems there are to occur. Here in our story today, uh, apparently, right, remember in Acts chapter 2, we're told that all the disciples, they shared what they had, and, and no one was in need. <laughs> a couple chapters later, it's continued to grow, and now there's an issue because some people are in need. We have these two groups of people. We have the Hellenists and the Hebrews. Now, the Hellenists, that's just a fancy way of saying uh, Greek-speaking or Greek-in-origin in people, people who were not Semitic. They felt like their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Apparently, these, these apostles, this church, has, they've got a food program. They have a food pantry that operates every day. Every day, people can come and get food. You see, widows were so easily cast to the side. But the Greek-speaking widows, they feel like they're being mistreated. So they, they, they come to the apostles and they say, we're being overlooked here. And the apostles have two options, right? They could say, be quiet. No, you're not. But they, they say, okay, wait a minute. Let's listen to this complaint and let's come up with a solution. And the solution that they have is they appoint seven men to oversee this ministry of, distri of distributing food every day. And this is where I think Shakespeare might be a little wrong. What's in a name? I think there's a lot in the names of these people. All seven of these people have a Greek name. All seven of these people have a name that is Hellenic. They are members of the community that has been overlooked. They, they are people who, who were part of those communities that felt 
like they were being overlooked or discriminated against. Now, we have to be clear that appear that this was an intentional, like, give to the Jews instead of the Greeks. It doesn't appear that that was an intentional decision that was being made. It appears that it was an unintentional side effect of the growth of this community. But the way they solve that problem is by picking seven people. And the seven that they pick all have Greek names. They appear to be members of this overlooked community. You see, the apostles look around and they say, wow, God is sending us people. God is, 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 is growing our community. And that has led to new issues. How do we solve this issue? They recognize that the, 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 the challenge in front of them is an invitation from God to do even more than they were. It's an invitation not just to do more, but to involve more people. Right? It would have been really easy for the apostles to say, hey, look, yeah, we see that you need food, but our plates are full. And Jesus appointed us as the leader of this church or this community, and we don't have the bandwidth, so unfortunately, this is just the way it's going to be. They could have said that. We've been in organizations that lead that way, probably. My... My docket is full, and I don't trust anybody else. So either I'm going to run myself ragged, or we're not going to do it. And the apostles do something different. They say, hey, we'd like to delegate some leadership. We'd like to delegate the administration of this thing to more people. We'd like to give more people the opportunity to be involved in what is happening here. And again, let's remember that all 12 of the apostles are Jewish. And so I think it's, it's an intentional decision to appoint seven Greek people, seven Roman people, somewhere in there, to be the ones who lead this distribution of food. They share the load. And I love that when Luke tells us this story, we've got rapid growth at the beginning, which leads to a problem. The disciples solve that problem in a way that the whole community likes, by the way, which is like if you've been in an organization, that's incredible, right? Have you ever been in a board meeting where you go, hey, here's our plan, and everybody's like, sounds good to me. There's not one dissenting voice. Not one! That's how you know God's involved, I guess. But then Luke ends this scene with more good news. Because he says, The word of God continued to spread, and the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem. And even more so, a great number of the priests became obedient to the faith. See, what Luke is basically telling us is that because the disciples made the decision, that again, I want to say is not an easy decision, because they made the decision to share their load, because they made the decision to involve more people, God used that to abundantly increase even more the number of disciples. You see, the lesson that I see here for the church is that the church is at its best when it shares the load. When it involves the people. When it involves you. It's really easy. I, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been in ministry for over 10 years, but that means there's a lot of my life where I was not in ministry and I was a congregant. And it was easy for me to look and go, hey, that's the leadership's problem to solve. That's, that's the pastor's job. That's the elder's job. That's the whatever person's job. But Luke says, no, no, no. The, the church solves this as a body. 
You know, I have friends who lead churches who can't believe the fact that we still have congregational meetings every year. They're like, man, pretty outdated, they will say. Whatever. Seems to be what they did here. I, I love that every year we go, hey, here's what we're thinking. Here's how, we, here's, how we, here's how we anticipate the next year. Here's how we anticipate. It's our best guess, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty clear to caveat that every year, that we don't fortune tell. We can only imagine. But here's our thought. I love that I get to lead a church that wants your in, input. I will confess that at times it slows things down. It slows decisions down. I don't get to make calls on my own and go, yep. Here's the budget for next year. I think it makes us better, though, because it involves all of us. It involves the members of this place, which I think is what we see here. You see, one of the reasons that service is one of our five core values here at Westwood is because our leadership knows that this church and all churches are at their best when the load is shared. When the the work that's being done isn't being done by a small group of people. The broader the number of people that serve a community, the healthier it is. The, The more people who are serving, the more people who have ownership. We know that one of the most important things to lifelong faith, the the studies have shown it over and over and over again, that one of the most important things for young people staying connected into a church when they grow up and move away from home is were they involved at their home church or did they just attend? Because if the only thing that a young person does is get dragged to church, they're pretty happy to stop being dragged to church. <laughs> but if we can help young people find a place that is theirs, they are more likely to stick it out when they grow up, start their own family, go to college, whatever it may be. So we, we, we value service here at a church because we know that it's best not just for our church, but, but for the people who serve. We know that It's it's better for you. You will feel more connected to your community. You will feel more connected to God. You will feel more fulfilled. And you will feel like your life is more abundant. And and this isn't just me as a a preacher talk. Like the, the, the studies have shown this over and over and over again. I'm not just trying to sell a bait and switch here. Like help me out. I'm just telling you what the people who spend a lot of time looking at Excel spreadsheets tell me. That service, service is one of the most important things that we can help people do in a church. But it's more than just it's helpful. Jesus, Jesus has some words about serving as well. In John chapter 13, Jesus washes his disciples' feet right before they eat the Last Supper. He's hour, I mean, he's less than 24 hours away from dying. He's maybe four hours away from being betrayed. The end is nigh. And he washes his disciples' feet. And then in verse 12 of chapter 13, he says, John writes, after he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor messengers greater than the ones who sent them. His point is, I have modeled service for you. Service is a value in the kingdom of God. Right? The first will go last and the last shall go first. There's good news for being at the bottom of the totem pole, he says. Service is a way that we bear witness 
to God. It's a way that we show the world the image of Jesus. It's a way that we show the world the way that God has worked on us because it is my conviction that you do not serve someone willingly without the power of the Spirit transforming your heart. <laughs> Left to my own devices, I sure want to be served. Get my, uh, get my slippers, Nathaniel. That's the way I'd like life to go. But through the power of the Spirit, I can be changed into someone who wants to serve my brothers and sisters as Jesus did. Now, let me be very clear. We are a church that is abnormal when it comes to serving. We are, we are abnormal in a good way. I was at a conference about a year ago where I was talking about, you know, they asked, you know, what's the health of your church? And I said, well, you know, it's this really interesting thing where like 75% of my people are serving on some sort of team. And they were like, what? Like, you're kidding. I came back and I, I, I did the math and I, I overestimated a little bit, but not by much. It's like 65%, almost two-thirds of our church, two-thirds of our members serve on a team somewhere. That is abnormal, y'all. The, the, the famous cliche in church world is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And, and, and the, you know, mo many books have been written about how do we get that the other way around, where we can get 80% of people doing more of that work. We're a church that, that's abnormal in this way. So hear me say, I'm not preaching a sermon on service today, thumping the pulpit or whatever, trying to say, get up. I'm here to say, thank you. I was able to go on leave for, you know, four weeks. And, and it was amazing. How I could, you know, we, we set up a bunch of meetings beforehand, like, hey, here's, here's what we need. And people said, yeah, we can do that. And it happened without me. And boy, that's humbling. Man, they don't, they don't need me as much as I sometimes think they do. But man, is it exciting. So encouraging to be a part of a church where people are so dedicated to their brothers and sisters that they'll serve multiple weeks in a row sometimes. Do you know, <clears throat> maybe not, that every week, just for Sunday morning, we have 22 spots that need to be filled. 22. Between greeting and security and tech and children's, and who's making the coffee, because that's important, and who's reading scripture, and who's praying, and who's leading communion, who's on worship, who's on you know, our, our song team. That doesn't include our eldership, our, our, you know, our grounds, the people who, who make this look beautiful. It doesn't include preaching, it doesn't include finance, it doesn't include missions. 22 people just to help this thing we're doing right now happen. That's, that's, that's a lot of people for a small little church, isn't it? And, and now, amazingly, most weeks that happens without too much problem because of you. 67 or whatever percent of our church is in a serving team, and that is awesome. Now, some of you are going, well, I'm not on a serving team. Maybe there's a little bit of a sell today. If you're not on a serving team, I would love to talk with you about how to step into a team, about where we have space for you. Because I promise you, we have space for you. I promise you that there is a spot where we would love to have you, whether it's handing out bulletins or, or helping pass communion. I will teach you how to hit the arrow button in the tech booth to help our slides happen. Maybe you're, you've got more capacity than that. I'd love to teach you how our soundboard runs. I'd love to train you how to teach our children about the love of Jesus. I'd love 
to have you help us read scripture, pray for us, lead us to the table of the Lord. I'd love to have your help because it is my conviction that the church is at its best. The church is at its best when the load is shared. The, one of the ways that we love our brothers and sisters is by serving them. And hear me say, that doesn't just mean on Sunday morning. There are other ways that I would love to help you serve. Westwood has a partnership with Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. They're the ones who we're doing the, uh, the, the trunk or treat with this coming Saturday. They have a food pantry. They have a midday slot and an evening slot. Part of that food pantry, they have a clothes closet. We know, it's getting cold, right? <laughs> we know there are people in our communities who need new shoes, who need coats. I'd love to help plug you into serving at that food pantry or clothes closet to serve our community, to love our neighbors. We've got opportunities coming up to serve at our, our, our church camp that we send children to every year to help them get the camp ready for the winter so that it can be ready for the summer. We've got needs here where you can help serve by, you know, helping us pull up weeds, helping us get the church ready for winter. There are lots of ways, lots of opportunities to get involved. So if you're not serving, I want you to uh, grab one of these Connect cards. And at the back, there's a, there's a, the first bullet point is, I'd like to serve at Westwood. You can check that box and write your name and your email address on there, and I'll reach out, and we'll talk about where you could do that. We'll find a spot that works for you. Now, if you are serving somewhere, I want you to think about this. Uh, oftentimes, we plug in to what I'll call the, 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 the lower threat opportunities. Passing communion, greeting at the front door. And those are great places to start. But if you've been doing those things for a while, maybe it's time for you to consider stepping into a different role. Stepping up into a role where you're going to help teach our children. Or maybe you'll read scripture for us. Right? Think about the things that new people to serving are less likely to step up to do. And where might you help us? By creating a space for someone to step into serving. One caveat before I close in prayer. I've been around the church long enough to know that when sermons like this get preached, the people who are already serving in 12 places say, sign me up for a 13th spot. I know that's what happens. If you fill out a connect card, I will throw it in the trash. Because... It's not my hope that you run yourself ragged. It's not my hope that you feel like, man, Adam thinks I'm not doing enough. That's not at all what I'm saying. This is, this is just about a way that I want to talk about the value of service is that we love one another in this act. We show our appreciation to God when we serve. And I truly do believe that it will help us grow as followers of Jesus. I truly believe that it will help establish you in a community. I truly believe that it will help reveal parts of you that God is working on. Because every morning when I have to pour a bowl of cereal, I think, I think I was doing this at eight. But I also realize, yeah, but it's my pleasure because someday they won't need me to pour their cereal and I'll miss those days. So my invitation to you is to bear witness to God through service in some way. And I don't expect you to solve it for yourself. I'm happy to help you. We have a leadership, elders, who'd love to sit down and talk with you too about how you can get involved. We'd love to talk with you about how to get involved. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to every single person who serves week in and week out. Thank you for making us a weird church. 
I, I'm grateful. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to learn about the model that you gave us of a servant. Thank you for the opportunity to, to learn from your word. Thank you, God, for serving us. God, I pray that we would be people who look for ways that we can serve our brothers and sisters. I pray, God, that you would show us the opportunities in front of us. I thank you, God, for every single person here. Thank you, God, for making us a weird church. May we continue to be weird in service to you. God, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.